Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, muy buenas tardes a todos ustedes. Thank you so much for being here with us at the Albuquerque Museum. Um, as Elizabeth mentioned, I'm the curator of history here and I'm very proud uh, to welcome these wonderful individuals to the stage in just a minute. Um, I'd like to thank you all for coming to our opening panel for the Nuclear Communities of the Southwest exhibition, which if you haven't gotten a chance to see it, we do hope you stop by um, once the panel discussion and the reception are over. So also, please enjoy some uh, light refreshments once we're done with the discussion. Um, I'd also like to recognize Ezequiel Acosta, who's sitting in front here, um, and Kate Romanek, two of our, yes, two, um, Two of our amazing student interns, as well as Jonathan Wright, our assistant curator of history, um, who originated and worked so hard on the exhibition that focuses on the history of and the responses and the artist's responses to the nuclear age in New Mexico. I'd also like to thank Tina Cordova for her generous guidance on some of the content that you'll see in the exhibition. <laughs> Um, she inspired me to look closer into my own family connection to the labs and patiently listen to those stories and, and even shed a few tears with me as well. Um, Alicia, Paul, and Tina, we're so humbled and honored to have you with us this afternoon. Without further delay, no more from me. Um, I'd like to invite Paul to the mic to perform his original song. Thank you so much. meet the most wonderful people. I meet the most wonderful people doing this work. <laughs> so um, this song is for all of us, all the people that I work with, uh, fighting for compensation for RECA, for the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act, for scientists, for lawbreakers and lawmakers. It ain't over till we win. We'll come back again and again. On the side of the Santos, we'll fight for our friends. It ain't over till. It ain't over till we win <clears throat> So all you downwinders Come on over First Nations people Come on over uranium miners Come on over sister warriors Come on over scientists with children Come on over, lawbreakers and lawmakers. Come on over, the Trinity craters, not as big as the hole in our hearts. So it ain't over till we win. Our children know what's happening. If we fall by the wayside, they will step in. It ain't over till we win. It ain't over till we win. So cancer survivors, come on over. Farmers and ranchers, come on over. All you war heroes. Come on over, Marshall Islanders. Come on over, Paducah, Kentucky. Come on over, Moms of St. Louis. Come on over, we're all downwinders. Come on over, the Trinity craters, not as deep as the hole in our heart. So 
So it ain't over till we win Our friends know what's happening On the side of Kateri They will step in It ain't over till we win It ain't over till we win it ain't over till we win. It ain't over till we win. Woo. Thank you so much. Yeah, I have to give credit to uh, Tina and everybody that I work with and all you loving people and uh, a higher power for helping me write that song. I can't take all the credit. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Hi, everybody. Hi, mi gente. My name is Alicia Inez Guzman, and I'm so honored to be here with everybody today. Um, I wanted to begin first by framing this discussion. So as an investigative journalist with Searchlight New Mexico, uh, a nonprofit, we're a small, scrappy little team based in Santa Fe. Our job is really to hold structures of power accountable. And so in that role, I hold the nuclear industry accountable. And so what I try to do is toggle back and forth between the past and the present. And so I think that that's really important for a couple of different reasons. And one of them has to do with the fact that we're here today because the first atomic bomb was made and detonated in this state. Um, New Mexicans were the first victims and so Part of my role is to think about the pattern that that's created for us here, right? And so we can't think of what's happening in the present without considering what's happening in the past. And so what's happening in the present, I'll just give you a tiny preview before we dive into the questions here, is that we are entering into a new arms race. And so if you haven't heard, then uh, here's your first um, introduction, but really we are making plutonium pits, which are the triggers for nuclear warheads. We are making nuclear warheads, and then we are making the missiles that those warheads will be strapped onto. We really haven't done that since the Cold War. So this breaks with all conventions since the Cold War. And so as you can imagine, a lot of the most important work is happening in this state. So we are making plutonium pits at Los Alamos National Laboratory. And so a lot of my work has been to kind of look at what that means for our communities and the most impacted people in our communities. But of course, again, back to history and structures of power, it goes back to the first days of the Manhattan Project um, in New Mexico. And so with that framing, while we consider that the past is always present, I, I'm so honored to be here with Paul, the musico, and La Mera Luchadora here, the fighter, Tina Cordova. And so what I really wanted to do, um, now that we're thinking about the past and the present, is just to kind of take it back and ask them both about their own history. Where did you grow up? How far away from the Trinity site? Um, and you know, what were some of the stories that you heard about the morning of July 16th, 1945, which is when we detonated the world's first atomic bomb? So, thank you. Thank you, Alicia. And of course, before I get started, I just want to say thank you to everybody who's here with us today that wants to hear these voices that in the past have not always been heard or listened to. I want to thank the museum and everything that they're doing to bring this into the light of day. I want to thank Alicia Romero. We have formulated the most amazing <laughs> friendship out of a shared nuclear past. And Jonathan, thank you also. Ezekiel, thank you for conceiving of this 
exhibit. I want to thank, uh, there's so many of you that are here today that I recognize that have stood with us forever and ever. I want to thank you. I want to thank the members of the Tularosa Basin Downwinders Consortium Steering Committee that are here. Mary Martinez White, <laughs> Bernice Gutierrez, if you both would stand up. <laughs> Along with Paul Pino, we meet every Monday evening for about three hours, and we've been doing this for at least 10 years. And I mean, the dedication, we're volunteers, none of us are paid. The dedication that is um, put forth by these incredible inv individuals who have lived experiences, who are doing this because of their own families and their own communities and, and their own children and grandchildren is to be commended because very seldom do you have people put forward that kind of dedication. Alicia, thank you. Uh, amazing writing. You are a journalist extraordinaire. And this, the article, the article about the blessed woman in, um, <laughs> that had her organs harvested and then tested for plutonium, I was just mentioning recently, or somebody else mentioned to me, and I said, I second the motion. You deserve a Pulitzer Prize for that article. <laughs> Investigative journalism at its very best. And you're one of us, and God bless you. <laughs> uh, so the question was, where am I from? How did I get started in this work? Well, I always introduce myself as uh, the co-founder of the Tularosa Basin Downwinders Consortium, an organization that I co-founded 19 years ago with the late Fred Tyler. I am a native New Mexican. I was born and raised in the village of Tularosa, which is about 45 miles the way the crows fly from the Trinity test site. Is one, it is one of the entry points to the Trinity test site. Uh, I was raised in a family that was incredibly patriotic. My grandfather is buried in Belgium. He was killed in World War II. And the unfortunate thing is we didn't have the resources to bring everybody back. So most of us have never visited his burial site. Um, our lives were very much framed around the idea that it was a necessity to accept the nuclear industrial complex uh, and all things associated with it because we lived adjacent to the Trinity site and the White Sands Missile Range where they still detonate devices all the time. Uh, not nuclear, but using conventional explosives. And um, I grew up fully aware that, you know, we were influenced by that industry. I did the duck and cover drills during the day at school. And then at night when they would detonate devices out there and our house would shake and the windows would break and the walls would crack, I would wonder, is this a real thing or another test? And we lived with what I called very stress-associated uh, uh, anxiety about that all the time. Because you, know, you, you could be at school, or you could be at home and these tests would happen and you didn't know, again, if it was the real thing or not. Um, I was diagnosed with cancer at the age of 39. Uh, I'm a business owner of 34 years. I have a roofing company here in Albuquerque called Quest on Roofing and Construction. I'm a general contractor, licensed general contractor. And at the age of 39, when everything was going gangbusters, I was diagnosed with cancer. Um, the first thing they asked me was, when were you exposed to radiation? And I said, they asked, were you, did you work with radioactive isotopes? Did you work in a lab facility? Did you ever have a lot of x-rays? I said, no, no, and no, but I lived downwind of the Trinity site, and I know that that was my uh, exposure. I actually have a degree in biology with a minor in chemistry. I did biological research. I know just enough to understand all of this and knew exactly why I had cancer. Um, I'm the fourth generation in my family to have cancer since 1945. I had two great grandfathers alive at the time in Tularosa. In 1955, 10 years later, they were bi both diagnosed with what was called stomach cancer. We'll never know. There was no testing. There was no treatment. They were given morphine and sent home to die, and in a very short period of time, that happened. Both my grandmothers had cancer. My dad, who was a four-year-old child drinking mass quantities of cow's milk in Tularosa, uh, died at the age of 71 after suffering uh, for close to 10 years. He had three different cancers he didn't have risk factors for. My dad didn't smoke, uh, didn't drink much. 
uh, never used chewing tobacco. He was fastidious about those sorts of things and, and didn't have any viruses. But my dad got cancer the first time at the base of his tongue. Um, I cannot adequately describe what it's like to watch somebody go through that, uh, having part of your tongue taken, having all the lymph nodes in your neck extracted, having radiation for, for weeks on end, um, being on a feeding tube for over 18 months, losing mass quantities of weight, learning how to speak and swallow again, only to get prostate cancer. <laughs> and then eight years after the original uh, cancer in his mouth, my dad got cancer at the forward part of his tongue. It wasn't metastatic. They knew that on a cellular level. And when I asked the doctors here, how does this happen? And they said, it doesn't, but we see it all the time in New Mexico. The incredibly tragic thing for my family now, because we don't ask if we're going to get cancer, we ask when it's going to be our turn, because everybody else has had cancer. My only sister has had cancer. My mom's being followed for a tumor. My mom's sister died from cancer. My dad's sister just finished uh, treatment for cancer, and I've lost track of the cousins, aunts, and uncles. But the incredibly tragic thing in my family now is that at the age of 23, my young niece, Mackenzie, whose art is in the art exhibit, has been diagnosed with thyroid cancer, and now she's the fifth generation in my family. I wish I could say we are unique. We're not. We've documented hundreds and hundreds of families in New Mexico that are displaying four and five generations of cancer. Paul's family, Mary's family, Bernice's family, all over. Uh, we've been collecting health surveys for the better part of the last 17 years, and we know what we know. Uh, big failure on the part of our government to never return and do an assessment of this, folks. We've been left to deal with it without any sort of assistance from our government, and shame, shame on them. And, um, and so that's how I came to do this work for the last 19 years. And I'll um, now ask Paul <laughs> to talk about his history. Cool, thank you. Yeah, I grew up on a ranch outside of Carrizoso, New Mexico. Carrizoso is 38 miles from ground zero. And uh, I grew up, I was born in 1954, so a little bit after the bomb, but I had four family members that were alive and living at the ranch at the time. And, and at that time, even whenever I grew up, like in, when I was born in 1954, Carrizoso had the most pristine environment, you know, that I could imagine. There was absolutely zero uh, air pollution, no plastics, no water pollution, no light pollution. We didn't have electricity for a while. Um, and the, so, so it was a pristine environment. We used to drink out of the streams in the mountains. We used to dream, uh, drink out of the, the rocks that would gather rainwater. We drank rainwater, and it, and it tasted so good, and it was... If you've never, like, drank rainwater or washed your hair with it or cooked beans with it, it's like, it's a difference. It's just like, it's something else. And so in that pristine environment, this is what happened to my family that was alive at the time. My mom, Esther Pino, had multiple bouts with skin cancer. She ended up, then she was diagnosed with, uh, with bone cancer, and she died shortly after that excruciating death. That was uh, so hard for our family to endure, so hard for her to endure. And she was a ranch woman. She never complained about anything. I never heard her say, ouch, in my life, nothing. But that was really, 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 really uh, a terrible thing, a terrible way to go. Um, my big brother, Greg Pino, he got stomach cancer and and... About two or three, three months after that, he passed away. He was living in Washington, D.C. He worked for the CIA all his life, dedicated his whole life to, to the good of this country. And he died of stomach cancer. My sister, Margie Pino Hobby, she got thyroid cancer, and so they removed her thyroid. And now to replace what her thyroid used to do, she takes a, has to take a bunch of medications, always changing, you know. The, and, and her life has never been the same, but thank God she's alive. My other sister, Carmen Pino, she lives down in Alamogordo, and she's had um, 
brain tumors operated on twice. And, um, and the same with her, like when we were traveling one time, she had a big a plastic see-through uh, bag uh, with a bunch of bottles in it. I says, are those your medications? And she says, yeah. It was like, I, you almost have, a, to have your own separate suitcase to carry the freaking medication. It's really, really rough. And thank God they're alive, but their lives are no longer the same. And um, I think that's it. <laughs> thank you for sharing that. I know it's not easy to talk about these histories of illness. So, you know, how did you begin, Tina, you kind of mentioned this, but how, do you, how did you begin to really correlate that with what happened the morning of July 16th, 1945? And, and if you all don't know, plutonium has a half-life of 24,000 years. So if it's in the environment, it's there virtually forever. And you know you can take it into your body in a couple different ways, which Tina knows very well. You can inhale it, you can get it through a cut, um, or you can ingest it. And so there are a couple different pathways in which plutonium can start to damage your cells over time. And very typically, if it's in your body, it will always be in your body. And so how did you begin to correlate this history of illness and to track that pattern, because it sounds to me like a pattern and a trend with what happened that morning was, you know, was at first, did people know or was it only after time, after several generations of um, repeated cancer diagnoses and, uh, you know, cancer diagnoses that don't fit a kind of lifestyle, right? Because a lot of times if you get a cancer diagnosis, they might say, well, you were a smoker or X, Y, Z, but that doesn't sound like it was the case in your family, drinking rainwater and beans, which I'm here for, and, um, and you know, drinking acequia water or you know, harvesting your own crops, those kinds of things. So if you could just speak to how you began to correlate that day, which changed everybody's lives, our lives, and, and really the world's lives, and the pattern that then unfolded in both of your families and how that kind of informed your advocacy? Well, first of all, um, in doing this work for as long as I have, oh my gosh, countless people have told me their stories of what they remember from that day. Unfortunately, that generation is almost gone now. Um, they were children at the time. Their, their little bodies received the higher doses and they're the ones that manifested cancer late, later in life and they're gone now. But after doing the work for 19 years, I've heard amazing stories. And maybe one of the, the, first of all, the story that is resounding amongst people from all different communities is that they thought it was the end of the world. You can imagine how grand it was. Uh, a lot of people don't know this, but the bomb at Trinity was more powerful than the bomb at Nagasaki. They were just detonated differently. The bomb at Trinity was detonated in a fashion that made it very fallout producing. Right? They detonated it close to the ground. The force of the bomb went down, intercepted the earth, and then brought up all this fallout. The, the, the bomb actually ascended, uh, at estimate, somewhere between 40,000 and 70,000 feet high past the atmosphere into the stratosphere. And we know now, because a young scientist at Princeton recreated the blast using today's technology and released the findings recently, and we know now that the radiation went over New Mexico for a number of days, just sort of stood there, and then started to, to, to go off in different directions, and it irradiated 46 states, Canada and Mexico. And that is quite contrary to what the government had told us forever, which is the fallout just went over the northeasterly part of New Mexico, the most unpopulated parts of New Mexico, and no offense, but I always used to say, so it went over Clanch, and I know that they developed that narrative so that we would believe what they always said. Nobody lived here, nobody was harmed, but we know that that's not the truth. So the first narrative is that people thought it was the end of the world. And most people dropped to their knees and started praying and were traumatized by what they experienced. 
Uh, keep in mind, most of the towns in New Mexico didn't have electricity, so there was no radio, no television, no telephone, no way to communicate with the outside world about what had just happened and what they had just experienced. It was very traumatizing to people. Um, the second thing that people have shared with me over and over in all these communities was that an ash fell from the sky for days afterwards, okay? It got on everything, and like Paul alluded to, we didn't have running water in 1945 in most parts of New Mexico. It was our rainy season, it was July, we had significant monsoons back then, so as that ash fell from the sky, it became part of our water supply. Tularosa has the largest ditch system in all of New Mexico. We counted on the water from the ditches, the water that we collected in our cisterns, the holding ponds, the rivers, the lakes, and everything would have been charging up in July, right? And now that's all contaminated with the radioactive ash that had plutonium with a half-life of 24,000 years, but other radioactive iodines, like I mean, radioactive isotopes like iodine, which we take up in our thyroid. It's no wonder we have so much thyroid cancer like strontium that we take up in our bones, like cesium, and those two have much longer half-lives. So now that's part of our environment. The second thing is, we didn't have electricity, we had no grocery stores. You couldn't go someplace and buy meat, dairy, or produce. You went to a mercantile store, you bought sugar, rice, coffee, flour, cereal, but all the rest of those things were produced by your own means, at your own home, through your own effort. And we hunted, we hunted a lot of mammals and birds. And that's how we fed ourselves. So now our gardens and our orchards were completely contaminated and all the animals that we raised were contaminated and the grasses that they grazed on were contaminated. And like Alicia said, we were ingesting it, we were inhaling it, and we were absorbing it through our skin. Um, when I was in college, uh, it became acutely aware for me, I became acutely aware that the reason people were so sick in my little town and dying was because they were overexposed to radiation and our gov ne government never warned us before or afterwards and we were sick and dying now. And so that's when it became part of my awareness and that's when I started to do a little bit of uh, research and I started to talk to people about it and I started to ask questions and that was way before I started working through the Tularosa Basin Downwinders Consortium. Um, but now that we have opened up this dialogue about this exposure, it is truly remarkable, the stories that people have shared with us and the family histories. And, and so we are very grateful for everybody that has participated and come forward with their histories and their stories. Yeah, um, I came to the realization of how bad things were slowly over decades. I remember that I wrote a song called Downwind because I saw something on Channel 5 about the poor downwinders in St. George, Utah. And I saw that and said, how on earth could they possibly do that to people? They had all this proof, all kinds of kids dying, sheep, animals, people. And, and I just couldn't believe it, so I wrote a song about it. Stayed that way for another decade or two. Then, then I heard about then I heard about the Tularosa Basin downwinders, and then I thought, oh no, those poor people in Tularosa. <laughs> and then I looked at it closer and I says, oh, Tularosa Basin, and Carisoso's in there. And then I went to a presentation with Mariah Gomez over here. Raise your hand. She has the best book ever. And, and with my cousin Bernice over here who kept bugging me and telling me, you need to learn about this. Come on and check it out. And Tina, they made a presentation about, um, about a health impact assessment that they had done. And, and I took my two grandkids that were in elementary school, and one of them was almost 20, 21. And I took them to this, and there was a gathering like this. And it lasted about two hours. And then, and that's where... It, I learned everything that I should have learned since I was a kid. Everything that I should have started learning in first grade. I learned it in that two hours. And I looked over and my granddaughter, there was tears in her eyes. And I was thinking, man, should I have brought the, the little ones to this? You know, it's not, this isn't like exactly a, uh, if it was a movie, <laughs> you'd, you'd want to have a warning on it for kids, you know. But, 
but I talked to the kids and I saw and they, uh, and they understood everything that was going on, the elementary, my elementary grandkids. And in the end, I was very, very, very happy that they learned so early, you know, because I didn't. The, the government hid this stuff really well. You know how, how many times I heard people talk about the, the bomb in my hometown of Carrizozo? Zero. Never. They, you know, cancer takes a long time, you know, and whenever it, it's like incremental and it creeps closer and closer to you and then it's in your family, you know, and you don't really notice, you know, and it's, and I, I was surprised how clear it became after I heard their presentation, all the pieces of the puzzle. That's why my mom had cancer. That's why my brother had cancer. That's why my sisters had cancer growing up in such a pristine environment. And uh, that's how I came to the realization. And man, I am so glad that you all are here today. I'm so, so glad that there's so many people here. This is wonderful because education is where it's at. Knowledge is where it's at. So thank you so much. Yeah. I agree. I think there's something very powerful. <laughs> you know, about speaking the truth in public. Right, and I think you know that is powerful, specifically in response to this history, because it is founded on secrecy, and so you know the history of the weapons laboratories and the history of the Manhattan Project is really the history of secrecy in this nation, secrecy in the name of national security, and so you're able to justify all sorts of things in the name of national security, right? But we see all these trade-offs in our communities that are made here in New Mexico um, in our, you know, with our native relatives, with our Hispanic relatives, really across the state in the name of secrecy. And so a lot of, you know, what we do is come to knowledge over time. And I think that's what you're sharing with me is that because we only have kind of a slice of that experience, which is typically very anecdotal, right? Then we have to kind of put it into context and be able to understand, well, how does this fit into the history of secrecy and the history of, you know, a series of, uh, you know, weapons expansions um, here in this state where very typically there is so little oversight. And that's not on purpose. I mean, that's on purpose, right? That's very intentional is that when you get you know, a very small number of people working on something, there is going to be very little oversight. And so that makes it our job, I think, to speak the truth to speak the truth in public. And so I'm happy to do that with you too today. And so I want to talk about the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act. So after having kind of real come to the realization slowly or quickly about these histories of illness and correlating them with this moment in time you know, now we have RICA, the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act, and I want, you know, you two to both tell me about it, but um, to describe what it, what it does currently and uh, why it has never included the first victims of an atomic detonation, which is here in New Mexico. Um, and so the next question would be, what would it cover if it did get expanded uh, for New Mexicans? Yeah, and I'll let Tina answer all of this question because she knows everything. <laughs> I'm gonna learn some stuff. She knows everything. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. And then I'm gonna ask Paul to tell you all about the day of the test in Carrizozo and the Geiger counters and the cattle trucks. I want him to tell you that story. Um, I also want to say hi, Mariah. Thank you so much. Mariah has been on our steering committee in the past, and she actually has contributed a great deal to our organization, and we, we thank you, Mariah. And I want to also recognize Jay Coughlin, because you, you, many of you have that incredible pie chart in front of you now, and it was through the efforts of Jay Coughlin, Nuke Watch New Mexico, and our board member, Holly Beaumont, who always wanted to construct this, because visuals mean a lot, and we have done that now, and the reason I mention it is because I'm gonna talk about RICA, and the fact that they always use the cost of RICA against us. 
Um, if, and so now we know that, that that can't be used against us any longer. They're really going to have to overcome Jay's pie chart when they say that next time. Um, so the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act was put in place 34 years ago in 1990. Uh, truly the godfather of RICA, I'm going to call it RICA, the godfather of RICA was Stuart Udall, Secretary Udall. Secretary Udall had served in Congress and then eventually was the Secretary of the Interior. And when he retired, he moved back to St. George, Utah. And he realized when he retired that there were all these people that were sick and dying. And not just downwinders of the Nevada test site, but they were also uranium workers. So he started filing claims. And his son, Tom Udall, Senator Udall, told me this story directly. He said that they were filing claims on behalf of all of these people, and they were winning in every level of the court. And they made it all the way to the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals. And Secretary Udall, being uh, in the know as he was and very wise, he said, well, what was happening? They were winning in court, and at every level in the court, they were saying this was in the interest of national security, so the government cannot be held accountable for damages. All right? So Secretary Udall said, the only way this is going to work is if we enact a law. And he went to Orrin Hatch from Utah, who was a Republican, and he went to Ted Kennedy from Massachusetts, who was a Democrat, and he got them to work together uh, to pass the bill. Now, the question is always asked, why were the people of New Mexico left out? And we will never fully know the answer to that question, but the way I answer it is this. We had two senators, just like the other states that were included. Where were our senators? No one was looking out for us. And, you know, we've had people tell us, well, we weren't connecting those dots. But if you're connecting the dots one place, how can you not be connecting the dots someplace else? And it's not just that. During the testing at Nevada, they had monitoring stations all across the American West. Monitoring stations were in New Mexico. And we were being dosed from the Nevada test site as well. So, you know... We'll never know the answer as to why this was happening. In my mind, uh, maybe part of the answer is that we have two nuclear labs here, and it's really difficult to hold out one hand and say, maximally fund these labs, and then hold out the other hand and say, oh, and by the way, give us a little something because people are sick and dying because of it. Um, so, RICA has historically paid out $50,000 in reparations to downwinders in certain counties of Arizona, Utah and Nevada. The compensation ends right at the Arizona-New Mexico border. And I always say there's no lead curtain there that protects us in New Mexico. So if you live five feet into New Mexico, you're protected or taken care of through RICA. But if you live five feet into New Mexico, you are not. And um, they actually compensate people in Winslow, Arizona, that's 259 miles away from the Nevada test site. But they don't compensate the people of Carrizozo that were 35 miles from the test site. So, we have been fighting in Congress for 14 years to get the program updated, to keep up with the times, and to address an issue that's never been addressed through RECA, and that's that we need health care coverage. We will never fully know in the state of New Mexico how this has affected us financially, but let me tell you some statistics. First of all, on our health survey, we asked the question about how do you access health care. Inevitably, people mark Medicaid and Medicare on those health surveys. New Mexico is the state most reliant on Medicaid in the entire nation. 47% of the people here access health care using Medicaid. Okay, we think the number is much larger. If we could get everybody that would qualify enrolled, the number would be much larger. Recently, also, we were uh, made aware of the fact that New Mexico is one of the states in the country carrying the largest medical debt. We have about 2 million people living here. We're carrying $881 million in medical debt, a billion dollars. That is not a sustainable equation, folks. All of the exposure that we received, all of the people that are sick and dying and can no longer contribute in, into their families' incomes, um, it takes away from families. We never get an opportunity to develop generational wealth. We develop generational debt. Um, we talk about this all the time inside of our organization. It just happens to be the history of how this plays out. If you live in Carrizozo or Tularosa or Socorro or most parts of New Mexico and you get really sick, you can't get care where you live. You have to travel to places far beyond our borders sometimes. I mean, we took my dad to MD Anderson three different times while he was sick. Uh, 
there's a, a, ch a little child from Mescalero. His grandfather was one of my best friends growing up. He's been on chemotherapy since he was two months old. He goes to MD Anderson for those treatments. His father told me, if not for this community gathering around us, holding bake sales, holding garage sales, holding enchilada suppers to raise money to get him to MD Anderson, he would be gone. And so regularly now I say, you know, the Pentagon should have to have a weekly bake sale to meet their expenses. Because that's what we have to do. That's what we have to do. If you're from one of our communities, you know what I'm talking about. Because you have participated in helping families get their loved ones the care they need. So now what we're fighting for is health care coverage, $150,000 $150, payment of restitution one time, and that the program be extended for 20 years. What we're settling on currently, and what has currently been passed in the US Senate, is a one-time payment of $100,000. No health care, but a study to figure out how they'll implement health care if it can be added, and only a six-year extension. It's not what we need or want, folks, but it's some place to start with, and it passed the US Senate by a vote of 69 to 30 on March 7th. And we never see a vote like that in the Senate. We just don't see it. But I have to, I have to stress to everybody here that this is a nonpartisan issue. Exposure to radiation, being exposed to radiation, developing health problems is a nonpartisan issue. It affects the young, the old, the male, the female, the black, the white, the Democrat and the Republican alike. And if you look at the states that we're trying to add, they're states like Idaho, Montana, Arizona, Utah, Nevada, Colorado, red states. The really only blue state amongst them is New Mexico. Even Guam that we're trying to add is red. And I don't want to leave out that the bill also will, will uh, take care of and extend compensation and health care coverage to the post-71 uranium workers. And that's very important. I, very important. And maybe one of the most important, maybe one of the most, the, the biggest factor about why that's important for the post-71 uranium workers, and I don't know if most of you know this, and I know a lot of you are going to be shocked when I tell you, Indian Health Service does not provide cancer treatment. So if you get sick with cancer, I met a lady yesterday on the Navajo Nation. If you get sick with cancer, they go in search of cancer treatment for you and you can wait months. You can die waiting for treatment. And so getting the, 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 the health care coverage for downwinders because we have native downwinders and getting the post-71 uranium workers taken care of is very important as part of this bill. And speaking of the pie chart and just the money, you know, as we kind of barrel towards this new arms race and really expand our weapons complex, you know, we're getting ready to spend about $2 trillion. And so RICO compensation would be, you know, really quite a, a fraction of that. Um, what we have already committed to spend to expand our nuclear weapons complex. And that really ranges from the plutonium pits warheads, missiles, sub-launched missiles, and intercontinental ballistic missiles. And so we can't even compensate, you know, the first victims of an atomic blast. We can't compensate native miners post-71. I mean, it's really unjust. It's truly unjust and it's truly egregious. Que uh, lastima, as my mom would say. Um, she's here. And so, you know, I'm looking at the time and realizing we don't have very much time left, but we will be able to kind of talk afterwards. And so the one thing that I wanted to kind of ask both of you is, is you know, this is such a harrowing topic, right? Um, it, is, it is unspeakable, right, what's happened um, over the last 80 years. And so how do you carry on Despite all the, the obstacles, how do you take care of yourselves? How do you take care of your communities? I mean, that answer is obvious, but how, how do you keep this fight going? And 
what can people in the audience potentially do to be able to kind of build their own critical consciousness on this issue? Okay. Uh, yeah, also I want to track, uh, backtrack a little bit and tell you about what happened in Carrizozo at, at the time of the bomb. Uh, recently heard that uh, people gathered up their children and ran to the church. They went to the church and they were inside the church after the bomb because they thought the world was probably ending because the sun had come up on the wrong side of the earth and then disappeared. And also in the Santa Rita parish, and it's right there in black and white, they kept good track of people's souls. They kept good track of births and deaths, baptisms and all that thing. And so I went there and I checked it out and they have, they have the records right there in black and white, old Spanish script, looked like it was written with a quill or something. But, but in 1944, two infants died. In 1945, 10 infants died. I don't know what percentage of increase that is, but that was 1945. And Bernice, my cousin over here, she's, she's looking into infant mortality across the whole state and finding a lot of infant mortality in 1945. So 44, two babies died, 45, 10 babies died. The next year it went back down to, to uh, the normal average, which was like one baby passed away, you know, and it stayed that way for the rest of the years. Also in Carrizozo, it's the only place where they had a record of, of Geiger counter readings, and the Geiger counter readings went off scale, and I know exactly where they were. I know exactly where they were when they took those readings and they said, well, we'll evacuate Carrizozo when the level reaches this. Then they reached that and they said, well, we'll evacuate Carrizozo when the level re reached that. And they say, well, should we call the boss that was General Groves, who I hate? And, he's, and, and, and they said, no, don't call him. He might get upset, you know, might get mad, like nobody likes to hear bad news, whatever. And then the radiation started going down because it was probably gamma radiation which will kill you, and that's what it did to babies there, you know? And, uh, and the, the other people, it killed, us slow, uh, killed people slowly. But anyway, so that was Carrizozo. The other thing that we learned through oral history, and, uh, and, and this oral history is passed down by people that I know, they're brilliant, and they're, they're real smart, and they're all, they're passed away now. But they said that <clears throat> they hired a local rancher to, because he was a pilot, to drive around and, and see if, how far the radiation went. And he said he found radiation in every direction. He also, they also asked him to get his cattle trucks ready to evacuate Carrizozo if necessary. They're gonna ev evacuate people in cattle trucks. That's like, reminds me of like Auschwitz or something or what the hell are you doing, you know? Cattle trucks are the most disgusting thing. I'm a, ra I'm a rancher, I know, and uh, you hate to put cattle in them. And so um, I think that's about it from what I remember of, of the day of the blast. And um, the way I keep on going is, b is by things like this, and you, and all the wonderful people, uh, my cousins, Tina, so many people that I see here in the, in the audience, that, that uh, fight along with us, and man, does it raise my spirits to do it. You know, if I couldn't fight, if I was just one person, if, T if I had found out all this stuff and Tina had never done all this groundwork, you know, I would feel totally different. I would feel absolutely defeated, you know? And I'd be, uh, yeah, I'd be a voice, you know, howling in the wilderness, you know? But now, with, uh, with Tina and with all the work that has been done and with you people that are gonna spread the word and stuff like that, it really gives me energy to keep on fighting. So I like to fish. <laughs> uh, every chance I get, I'm in northern New Mexico or southern New Mexico alongside a lake or a river I love to fish, I love to garden, I love to cook, I love to spend time with my family, I love to hike, I love to do all the things that we do in New Mexico, right? That's why we live here, because we love those things. I love to be uh, amongst the people that support us, just like Paul said, it gives us great energy. We were yesterday, <laughs> the four of us, and uh, 
on the Navajo Nation, they had this huge symposium. There were hundreds of uranium workers there and their families. And we introduced them to the concept of how they're downwinders. And so it was great to be amongst them yesterday. I have great energy left from that. Uh, and, you know, we do everything. My, my dad used to say something. <laughs> this is kind of funny. My dad used to say, you got to brand when the iron's hot. And not that we branded, but my dad used that saying, right, to make sure I understood. You better jump on things when you get the chance. And I mentioned this to my partner a couple days ago. He said, Tina, you need to take some downtime. You really need it. I can tell. And he said, you need to take some downtime. And I said, Russ, I've got a brand while the iron's hot. And he said, you've been doing that for 19 years. I might just remind you. And so, you know, we do all we can to take time when we need it. But the honest truth is, we cannot back down now. We, you know, I think about the early days when I couldn't get anyone's attention. <laughs> I, no one would listen to us. Now we're being interviewed by journalists from all over the world. You know, everybody wants to know our history. Everybody wants to tell this tale. And we're out there telling the other side of the Oppenheimer story, right? And we're so excited because there's a documentary now focused on the New Mexico Downwinders. It's winning awards at film festivals. We're getting standing ovations. People are signing up in droves to support what we do. And we have got to brand while the iron is hot. And that's what we're doing right now. And so we're ever grateful. We're ever grateful for people who want to learn more and want to support us and want to become part of our movement. And um, I can't thank you all enough, and I can't thank all the journalists who keep us out there in front of people. I hope that very soon uh, the documentary, First We Bomb New Mexico, will be on a streaming platform and it'll have a theatrical review. It deserves that. It's an amazing documentary that finally broaches this history. And let me just say one last thing. Um, shame on those movie makers who produced Oppenheimer. Shame on them. In the last couple of days, I've learned that they only said New Mexico twice in the entire film. Uh, when they've received awards all across the world, they've never acknowledged us. Even when they got an award for cinematography, you would have thought they would have said, oh, we had the most beautiful landscapes in New Mexico. Nothing. They took our tax incentives. They're going to gross a billion dollars on this movie. They could have started a dialogue that would have affected all of mankind around disarmament and nuclear reduction. They did none of those things. They're just raking in the money. And so for me, that's unacceptable. And you know what? I'm not going to dance around it anymore. Lots of people were harmed, and many of them were right here in New Mexico. And to have never acknowledged the part we played in the Manhattan Project or the part we played in making that movie is totally unacceptable. Thank you, Tina. I think we all needed to hear that. I think the words that we haven't spoken, but that you know have been an undercurrent here, are environmental racism and racism. And this is this is it, folks. This is how it is playing out in our state currently. And I think we need to remember that as we move forward. You know, when uh, when they were negotiating putting the Manhattan Project in New Mexico, they said, "Well, New Mexicans won't mind." Uh, this is what Leslie Grove said in his biography because they're overrepresented. Um, in World War II, and so they'll want to be able to participate and kind of get revenge in a way. And so, uh, especially in the Bataan Death March, right, you know, there's so many people in our communities who were overrepresented in the Bataan Death March. And so, again, this comes back to a history of erasure, right, a history of racism and a history of environmental racism, and that's still playing out now. We're barreling towards a new Cold War a new weapons race, and we have yet to properly reckon with the horrors of the last war. And so I'm gonna leave it there. Please see the exhibition. Thank you so much. I'm so honored to be here with you, Tina. I'm so honored to be with you, here with you, Paul. You are heroes, and I'm just really proud. Thank you so much. Thank you to all the people who've